Hey, it's Joseph from RoboFlow. I'm here with Jacob. And today we're gonna to be talking about two popular machine learning frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow. Now, I know this is often a heated discussion and often starts a lot of fires, but what I really wanna just break down is often why uh, you might prefer one over the other or what one might excel in where another one is weaker. And frankly, at the end of the day, remember that during this discussion, the best tool for the job is the one that helps you get it done. Not anything else other than that. So if you prefer one framework or the other, great. Now with that in mind, let's dive in. Jacob, PyTorch versus TensorFlow. What's your high level thoughts? Yeah, so before we kind of dive in into like each one of these frameworks, I, I just want to discuss a little bit about what they're trying to represent. So um, both of them are deep learning frameworks and, and uh, deep learning models are implemented uh, with uh, tensors and with uh, matrices. So they're both just trying to rep basically represent uh, matrix operations um, being performed throughout a model. Um, and so uh, kind of the raw level of the abstraction of what they're doing um, is uh, completely the same. Uh, so they're going to both be uh, taking in data, uh, passing that in a feed forward way through a network, um, calculating a loss function, um, and then back propagating uh, those losses back through the model so the model can be learning. And then after that process of learning is done, then they sit there and they can make inference for you afterwards. So they're kind of in a frozen state and uh, you're sending data through and you're getting inference back. So uh, from that standpoint, um, they are completely and entirely uh, the same to me. And I think to pretty much everyone out there. Now, of course, the devil is in the details. <laughs> and I mean, let's just take a second and just like reflect on the fact that people have really strong opinions on what are free, open source, democratizing, amazing tools. Um, like, it's just incredible piece of technology. Now, devil in the details, you were saying. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the details are, are definitely um, kind of where things get interesting. So uh, PyTorch, I like to kind of think about it as sort of just like a uh, deep learning framework wrapping up uh, NumPy. So NumPy is a um, popular library that's used to do matrix, oper matrix operations, and I think PyTorch uh, implements its functionality in a pretty translatable way, and oftentimes you can kind of uh, use the same kind of code snippets that you're using in, in NumPy in, in, uh, in PyTorch. Um, so I, I kind of think about it uh, that way, and it sort of grew out of, out of um, NumPy in, in that kind of a way, I think. Um, whereas TensorFlow um, sort of came in, and, and now this is a really important thing that we're going to get into, is that TensorFlow came in in two stages. So there's TensorFlow 1 and there's TensorFlow 2. So TensorFlow 1 had this idea of a, uh, a session. So you would uh, first kind of define all these variables, and then you would start a TensorFlow session. And then once you started the session, you could start manipulating and using these things. Um, but until you did that, uh, starting that session and printing out some code underneath there, uh, you couldn't even see or view uh, the things that were above, which was pretty problematic because um, you know the whole idea was to be creating this TensorFlow inference graph, and then you'd have this uh, graph that you defined, and then you could do all the stuff with it. But the problem is like, okay, well, as I'm building this graph, how am I even going to be interacting with it? Um, so they actually tried to scrap that entirely in TensorFlow 2 and made it into um, a uh, kind of like continuous execution state. So, so eager execution is what they call it. Um, and now this, this I think, kind of uh, led to all sorts of uh, problems therein. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, so I worked on TensorFlow back when, you know, it was in the, in the frozen session graph days and now in like the imperative programming days. And you kind of see where they're coming from with the graph dudes, right? Like, it has academic roots in its nature. You're going to declare your, your directed acyclical graph. You're going to define your data flows. And if you want to visualize those and then run data through it, that kind of makes sense. But programmers, and especially Python programmers that were picking up the framework, that just didn't make any intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. That you couldn't see or even identify above until you start a session and start running data through it. So in some ways, it was kind of like, You'd like draw a graph of the graph of where your data was going to flow, and then you'd like almost like run data through that graph. So almost imagine that like maybe you're building a system of like uh, like you have a cardboard box, and you're going to define like you're going to say like um, where um, based on this this box you're going to 
put some things in it, but <laughs> you don't actually get to, to, to see the contents of that box until you start a session. Um, now, I mean, the, um, the flip side of that is when eager, eager execution was introduced, um, I think was it Tensor 1.15 or it was in the later versions of Tensor 1.0 or 1.1 uh, end of life. Uh, and then TensorFlow 2 made it be eager execution the default. Um, now you made sort of a joke that then introduced some complications. Um, can you expand on that? Like, what what uh, what yeah. consternation has that caused? Yeah. So I think I think the biggest thing that that um, has introduced now is that you have a fission of uh, repositories that have been built on both. And so of course they're trying to kind of back support um, things that have have been uh, become commonplace from TF1 um, uh, in TF2, but there's a lot of things that don't translate. And so oftentimes as a developer, you're going through and you're trying to choose uh, which spot you want to be in, and you ultimately end up getting confused because you're not sure if you should be using a saved graph model or a um, or the model directory or how it's going to export. And then when you get to the next library that said it was TensorFlow supporting, it's actually TensorFlow 1 supporting um, and such. Um, so these things have kind of wrapped themselves around in a state um, that's a little little bit confusing. Now, PyTorch, on the other hand, um, certainly has those problems uh, as well as version new versions are uh, released, and you know you hit uh, compatibility issues where you're in PyTorch 1.6, I think we're at now, um, and the code that you the model you had before was trained in PyTorch 1.4, and all of a sudden this compatibility doesn't work, and 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 that is certainly true. Um, but you don't have the same uh, disjoint, I don't think, uh, uh, behind um, feeling like you're actually in a completely different framework. Um, uh, at least that's kind of how um, it sort of started to feel for me working through things. But um, but yeah, that's that's sort of where I think the fundamental uh, complications are starting to arise. What's interesting is that TensorFlow is still the more prominently used framework. Certainly, certainly. And so that's something I, I should keep in mind as, as I'm talking about things. It's the predominantly used framework, and there is a lot more supported there. So the breadth of things that you can do with it um, is um, often a lot wider. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of a, you know, the, Py, the PyTorch, I think, is a sharper tool, but the, the TensorFlow is a, is a bigger hammer, if, if that makes sense. I kinda, yeah, I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what I was going to get at is like the TensorFlow ecosystem is just so well developed, right? So like the the number of courses and Coursera and elsewhere and the, I mean even tools like TensorBoard, right? PyTorch just has no concept of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, TensorFlow Model Hub is now like a way that they're trying right. to like reproduce and do some of that. And I mean, um, that's just a testament to a head start and an investment from really Google in developing an ecosystem more broadly. Uh, which is which is really, you know, hats off for, for investing in those efforts. One particular thing that um, is a source of consternation at times is is the TF record uh, mm. file format. Um, so the TF record file format is a is a serialization object that TensorFlow introduced for uh, kind of like faster loading and, and uh, easier parsing, so you can pick up and drop off training more easily and scale training a bit more easily. Um, but um, that's not always always the case. So, um, well, I guess I should say it's not always the easiest to use. It, it is always the case that a TF record is a serialized file format that can accelerate your training, um, but that comes with its costs. So I've described what the TF record is to some degree. Maybe add to that, but also um, describe you know how it fits into this picture. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, TF record, I, I could go on for, for days, um, but the, the, the primary thing that, uh, you know, you have obviously serializing your data and making uh, your training faster is, is a variable, very valuable thing to do, but it's, it's not really intuitive in so far as if you have a TF record and everything's all serialized into one file, uh, you can't look at the data. So how do you even know that? Uh, your data is is of high quality. Like let's say you're in Vision and you're using image data, you can't actually look at the underlying images. You just kind of have this opaque uh, piece of data that, uh, if you want to view, you're going to have to deconstruct um, and then start looking at things. Whereas 
with Python or PyTorch frameworks, it, it seems more intuitive to kind of have the data as is in a viewable format and then put that through a training pipeline. Yeah, which um, I mean, I'm, and it, you could, of course, look at your data, then serialize and start training. It's not like if you use Tensorflow, yeah. you can't see your data. Yeah, yeah, um, not, but once it gets into the record, it's yeah. locked. Yeah. Um, yeah. What uh? What are some things? So I mean, the kind of like to summarize some of the things we've discussed so far. It's the the record, the the community and early start of TensorFlow is really an impressive feat of the breadth. Um, the specificity of PyTorch is in some ways a a really useful uh, feature, not a bug, in that like it's meant to do a, a single purpose a bit more deliberately. Um, now Detectron is a framework within PyTorch for mm -hmm. um, doing uh, vision tasks yep. that Facebook has released and open sourced. Um, but it hasn't really caught on with the same fanfare as some of the other, other frameworks. Um, yep. Why is that? Is that because it's early? Is it a bit unintuitive? Is it just what's, what's, what's keeping Detectron back from being bigger? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Um, but I do know that it just seems to be the case. Um, you know that the Tektron 2 is massively eclipsed by the TensorFlow object detection library. And I think the reason for that is primarily in not necessarily the quality of models or the training pipeline or any of that, but it's just the, the TensorFlow object detection library is ubiquitous in that it can, it can port to CoreML, it can port to um, OpenVINO, it can port to, uh, you know, TFJS, it can port in all sorts of areas that you might want to be taking it afterwards. Um, and that's something that I just actually haven't seen anything coming out of the Tektron 2 from, from that standpoint. Yeah, to your point, the like TensorFlow Model Hub uh, and Model Zoo uh, of having pre-trained weights for so many different architectures. I mean, there's like four different faster RCNN implementations that you can choose, let alone mm -hmm. MobileNet, SSD, and some of these. And that just... Um, not only is that like a bootstrap start to training, but it also means that you can, as you described, like TensorFlow is invested in the uh, integration with other tooling and get into you know ONNX and, and things like this. So um, it kind of speaks again to that community integration value. The ecosystem grows all right, like rising tide raises all boats sort of situation. Mm -hmm. What are some other key attributes of either of these frameworks that we haven't touched on? As you're, if, you, if you're building out machine learning frameworks and uh, you're thinking about the hardware that you're going to have available to you, um, the, the biggest thing about TensorFlow is it's, it's a TPU-based framework. It does apply to the GPU, but it is not optimized for the GPU in the same way that PyTorch uh, has been optimized to run with hmm. the NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so if you're going to be focusing on GPUs, um, you know, PyTorch is going to run a lot quicker for you there. Um, if you have a ton of TPUs at your disposal and you know how to operate those, TensorFlow is a good idea. But the the for, from the the take that I I have actually is that most people are getting into TensorFlow, are running it on GPUs, and they think training takes forever because Google's really the only one that has all the TPUs to make the language run the way that it should. Um, so that's one other thing I think to, hmm. to consider as you're thinking about the two. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't thought about that. Um, I think you can get the GPU optimized right, but out of the box, it might hmm. be easier with, with PySearch. Yeah, yeah, certainly. There, there might be areas of TensorFlow GPU optimization that I yeah. uh, just haven't embarked into. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, so you heard it from Jacob that um, never use PyTorch, always use TensorFlow. It's kind of a, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, the- uh, Use DarkNet. <laughs> yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> I knew it. Um, at the end of the day, the the again, the best tool is the one that gets the job done. And um, be sure to drop your thoughts in the comments of which framework that you've used and enjoyed, why you've enjoyed using that framework. Maybe links and resources for getting started with that framework. Yeah, um, definitely. Look forward to having a, a thorough discussion below about this conversation and these frameworks and what you think is best. And as always, like, subscribe, and, and share with your friends, and we'll see you soon.